so I want to keep us on time. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to Project Echo Geriatrics. Um, happy Friday. We're getting toward the end of the academic year. I'm sure some of you are really, really excited about that. Um, it's always a fun time to see people um, graduating and um, going on to the next thing. So that's great. Always fresh beginnings in July. Um, thank you for joining us. As usual, um, we'll have a short didactic at the beginning, and I'll introduce our speaker in a moment. And then we have a really great case to discuss with all of you and our interprofessional panel of experts. Um, Dr. Bay has a, has a really challenging case um, that'll be really good for discussion um, from all the different uh, perspective. So we'll appreciate your input on that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our, um, our speaker, who is Dr. Michael Chen. Uh, he is an associate professor of medicine in the division of cardiology. He is one of the very, very few geriatric cardiologists um, in the country. He is dual trained in cardiology and geriatric medicine. Um, and in addition to practicing general cardiology in the inpatient and outpatient setting, he also um, has a clinic that he does a half day per week in our senior care clinic and sees older adults um, for their ongoing cardiology care. And I always appreciate his approach to care. So thank you so much for coming today to talk to us about hypertension in older adults. It's been something that's been evolving over time, and we look forward to hearing the latest and greatest from you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the uh, invitation, um, and we will oops, um, get started. Uh, no disclosures, um, and I'm actually in um, in won't be discussing specific, uh, at least in, as part of the formal presentation, specific um, drugs. Uh, and so there um, shouldn't be any um, trade name issues either. Um, hypertension itself is a huge topic um, and uh, hypertension in the elderly uh, is an even more complex area. Um, so in 15 minutes, I'm certainly not going to review and nor am I intending to review all of, um, you know, diagnosis um, and treatment of hypertension. Um, but I wanted to talk about uh, an area that common to come up, um, that we come up with in taking care of older patients with hypertension, particularly those who are um, in the older age group, so over 80. Um, and a recurring theme, which is common throughout uh, our uh, specifically sort of geriatric cardiology is growing, but um, really inadequate um, data or um, high quality uh, research base for um, directing our care for specifically multimorbid or frail older adults. Um, so just a teeny bit by way of background, hypertension is obviously a huge problem and um, affects a very large uh, percentage of older adults. Um, in fact, uh, from Framingham data, it's estimated that the lifetime risk of developing hypertension is over 90% for those um, sort of middle-aged um, adults. In older adults, systolic blood pressure and pulse pressure, so the difference between systolic and diastolic, are more indicative of cardiovascular disease risk um, in older adults. And those with uh, an increased pulse pressure have a higher risk um, for cardiovascular events. Um, However, the systolic blood pressure alone tends to be less informative for cardiovascular disease risk in these frail and multimorbid patients. Um, and this is in contradistinction to younger adults where diastolic blood pressure is more predictive. Um, and this probably relates to that elevated diastolic blood pressure being more related to actual changes in peripheral resistance, as opposed to in older adults when, um, when vascular stiffness is responsible for a good deal of that um, uh, systolic hypertension and pulse, increased pulse pressure. Cardiovascular disease though um, is 
uh, events um, and disorders are related to hypertension, um, as you know, including stroke, coronary disease, sudden death, heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, end stage renal disease. Um, and we know that uh, sort of the, the higher blood pressure is, um, the worse it is prognostically. Um, and, uh, and treatment is extremely effective at ameliorating or preventing outcomes such as stroke, uh, MI, and heart failure. Um, so this is a familiar slide, and depending on which guidelines you may um, see or look at, uh, hypertension may be um, categorized a bit differently. Um, these are from the 2017 ACCHA hypertension guidelines, uh, which um, for us are sort of the, the dominant ones. Um, and you can see even in the normal range, uh, lifestyle modification is encouraged um, as a preventative measure for um, trying to lessen the chance that folks develop hypertension in later life, uh, or at least the severity thereof. Um, treatment uh, in uh, overall was directed in these guidelines um, to start uh, for primary prevention in those um, sorry, for primary prevention at a systolic um, blood pressure over 140. Um, but if um, either their 10-year ASCVD risk was over 10% uh, or the patient had um, other established comorbidities um, to begin at um, a systolic pressure of 130. As you know, some studies have shown um, sort of an inverse relationship between systolic um, blood pressure, or sorry, rather between blood pressure and all-cause mortality, particularly in the older age groups, um, such that there was increased mortality with lower blood pressures. Um, some reasons for this are pre-existing um, cardiovascular and um, neurologic disease, um, issues of uh, comorbid dehydration, polypharmacy, um, there are some who think that uh, remaining hypertensive uh, in later life may be a marker of actually being more robust, being able to be hypertensive in the face of other challenges. Uh, and then another thing to know, as with um, other conditions, as, as folks get older, um, the need for antihypertensives may decline over time, um, even in, uh, as opposed to in younger folks where it tends to, the need tends to increase. Um, observational studies in very um, frail older patients um, suggest that having a systolic blood pressure less than 130 is associated with higher morbidity and mortality, but not in those who have a, a naturally lower blood pressure, so treated hypertension, um, perhaps treating them too low. Um, is that because they've had hypertension for longer, they have ha suffered the um, sequela of perhaps undertreated hypertension, um, or is it um, because uh, we're over-treating um, and tissue hypoperfusion as a result of over-treatment of hypertension as a problem? Um, in 2016, an expert review of hypertension, particularly looking at um, institutionalized elderly, um, suggested a negative relationship between blood pressure and morbidity uh, again, especially in those who were treated for their hypertension. Um, these are patients that uh, are almost universally excluded from trials um, that were used to establish the benefit of the treatment of hypertension. Um, and this is, again, a real challenge for us in deciding how to treat people. Um, so to, de to help determine an appropriate strategy for the treatment of high blood pressure, particularly in the oldest old and those with comorbidities or, um, or frailty. Um, it, it's, um, the, sorry, that um, is something that's needed but not established. Uh, a very interesting article in the journal Hypertension um, sort of forms the basis of the rest of what I'm gonna talk about here. Uh, and gives a little bit of a framework for how to think about and perhaps categorize folks um, to come up with a strategy that might um, make sense for them and potentially benefit those patients. 
Frailty is something that you guys, I'm sure, are really familiar with as a multidimensional um, syndrome that uh, decreases the reserve that older patients have um, and the presence of frailty. However, almost however it's been defined as related to future dependence, hospitalizations, and other adverse outcomes. It's also been used um, to help, <clears throat> excuse me, to help uh, determine the appropriateness of certain interventions. In, in my specialty, it's been looked at in heart failure population um, prior to um, transvalvular aortic valve implantation, prior to cardiac surgery um, to help um, direct aspects of AFib care, uh, and then also in diabetes. Um, you're, I'm sure, familiar with the clinical frailty scale, um, which is a scale that uh, goes um, from one to nine, uh, from the very fit, um, essentially not frail, to those who are um, very, very frail uh, and, in fact, terminally ill. Um, and, and for the purposes of this article that I'm going to focus the, um, the rest of our time on, uh, it essentially um, sort of divides folks into three groups based on, um, based on the clinical frailty scale in general. Um, and uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over each of these. And this is sort of the central diagram from that article, which is meant to help us try to decide in older adults um, sort of what kind of category or phenotype do they have? Do they have a preserved function phenotype? Do they have some loss of function, but um, generally preserved ADLs? Or do they have both loss of function and altered ADL such that they're um, pretty dependent? Uh, and so we just have some um, mini cases, just really descriptions of patients that might fall into one of these three categories. The first is uh, a really robust 83-year-old, similar to a guy I saw yesterday who has diet-controlled diabetes and hypertension <clears throat> without prior complications. He has osteoarthritis, but he's still um, living independently. He walks despite the arthritis um, several times for, per week. He is hypertensive in clinic, um, but otherwise um, has an unremarkable exam and, and comes across as um, pretty robust. Uh, the next patient, though, is an 88-year-old, so a little bit older, um, has mild to moderate dementia, has a history of AFib and mild coronary disease without current angina. Um, she's had some falls, which she attributes to tripping on some throw rugs. She does use a walker. She lives with her daughter and son-in-law, and they help her with um, some of her ADLs, but not all of them. Um, so the first patient um, is really robust and um, has no loss of function and is totally independent with his ADLs. And such a person, and for such a person, one would consider just treating as if um, you know, age sort of wasn't an issue and, um, and going based on um, guidelines, uh, otherwise choosing lifestyle modification and medications to, to meet targets. In, in sort of the middle range, um, the loss of function but preserved ADLs, patients usually have a couple of comorbidities, may have um, moderate cognitive and or functional decline. Um, and, uh, and in this group, you might consider tailing their therapy, deprescribing, potentially um, being more liberal with um, blood pressure goals. Uh, and the reason for this is that even though there are some trial data for benefit of, um, of sort of moderately aggressive and even relatively more aggressive blood pressure control from um, HIVIT and INVEST, which are probably studies you're familiar with, um, the vast majority of these types of patients um, were excluded from those trials. Um, so even though you can demonstrate the benefit of even relatively tight control of um, hypertension in um, certain octogenarians, um, it, it can't be really considered universal based on the exclusion criteria from some of those studies. Um, Uncommonly, you may decide to, to, um, to perform or refer for a comprehensive um, geriatric assessment um, to try to better tease out whether um, the patient is uh, appropriate to think of in this sort of middle category or might be recategorized um, as being even more um, 
uh, limited. Um, so if in this assessment, um, even though they're in the middle category, you feel that they um, have relatively few comorbidities and really minor loss of autonomy, you might consider to be um, as aggressive or nearly as aggressive as with that robust gentleman in our first little vignette. Um, whereas if uh, in this analysis, you uncover multiple comorbidities, geriatric syndromes, and um, they appear more dependent, um, then you may sort of categorize them in the, um, let's take a step back and see if, if we should just be um, less aggressive and, and, um, and uh, just try to sort of keep them out of more immediate trouble. Um, and that those patients would fall into sort of the, the um, far right category um, as evidenced or as exemplified by this gentleman who is more clearly um, somebody for whom you would uh, choose to not be aggressive. So this is a 96 year old man with metastatic prostate cancer, um, which itself is no longer being treated. He has hypertension. He lives in an adult family home. He's actually wheelchair bound and needs assistance for multiple ADLs. Um, uh, although at the same time, he's still, um, you know, socially and mentally interactive doing the crossword, um, every day. Um, these patients in this, um, loss of function and altered ADL profile are usually at least 85. These are patients for whom a tailored approach, um, emphasizing, um, you know, symptom relief and quality of life might be a better goal than um, sort of a, a, a number based on um, guidelines. And um, this is something that, you know, can be discussed with the patient's um, to overall healthcare team uh, and the patient and any surrogate decision makers to say, you know, maybe we'll um, step back and not, um, not be so vigorous in our attempts at blood pressure control and, um, and see if, uh, fun at, the little bit of function that he has can still be uh, maintained um, with fewer medications, for example. In this group, you might consider uh, liberalizing to a blood pressure less than 150 or even higher if symptomatic, um, stopping medicines or reducing them if, um, if they are on treatment and um, uh, perhaps ex excessively controlled, particularly if there is orthostasis demonstrated either um, symptomatically or objectively, uh, and monitor for other things which may um, be problematic for um, somebody who is on antihypertensives. Um, there are smaller studies, which you guys are probably familiar with in terms of deprescribing um, medications for various conditions, which, uh, which appear to be well tolerated and even um, help patients out by uh, reducing polypharmacy. Um, so I covered up the lower half of the slide when I first introduced it, um, but we actually just did talk about all of those things, all of the things that are here, which are um, to think about in the preserved function, the robust older adults, even in the octogenarian or higher age range to um, treat them uh, as if they're more like their physiologic age, which um, appears to be lower. In the far right, folks that um, are uh, multi dealing with multimorbidities or high degrees of frailty, we might consider deprescribing, liberalizing blood pressure goals. And then in the middle group, just taking a really bit of a closer look at them and seeing if you might recategorize them in one direction or the other. Or you can, of course, just take a middle, um, just a true middle uh, approach between those two, ex um, quote, extremes. Um, so uh, I wanted to mention that I gave a talk a couple I think a couple of months ago now, the in the Northwest Geriatric Education Center series, which was um, a, a good bit longer, and uh, we talked about um, orthostatic hypotension, supine hypertension, secondary hypertension, uh, and things like that. And um, and uh, and I did discuss this uh, paper and its approach as well in that talk. Uh, the link for that is below, and I think. Um, Dr. Bennett said that she can send out um, the link also if, if folks are interested and um, can tolerate listening to my voice, but you could at least look at the slides if, um, if you're interested in um, sort of the, the, full, um, the full talk. Um, but I'm happy to, I don't know how much time I took, uh, 
I went a little bit over, I think, um, but I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, we definitely have time for questions. 